94.3 WYBC, the rhythm of the city. I am Wanda Coppage. You are listening to another great episode of The Electric Drum. You know, every Sunday I have the opportunity to sit and talk to some wonderful people, most of them right here from our community. Today, this evening is no different, and you're going to want to pay close attention to what this gentleman has to say. Why? Because he is running for mayor. You may already know him, some may not. That's why we provide this platform. His name is Tom Goldenberg, and welcome to the show. Hi, Wanda. Great to be here. Thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. So like I said, yes, many of you may know of him already. Many of you may not, which is why we provide the platform. And if you are listening or know someone who is also running for office, it's not just about Mr. Goldenberg. You could definitely come on to the show between myself, Juan Castillo, and Daryl Huckby. We will be happy to speak with you so you can introduce yourself to listeners as well. But we have Mr. Goldenberg right now. So let's find out all about him. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Are you a New Haven native? You from Connecticut? I grew up just outside New Haven and uh, West Haven around the Knox Street area. So it, it's it's first of all, it's great to be on the show. Um, I've been a long time listener, right, since I was a kid. I went, when I was growing up, there were two radio channels that we would listen to. One was 94.3. And the other was Hot 97. But back in the, those days, it was, I don't know if you remember this, it was difficult to get Hot 97 with the reception. I was just going to say, oh, you actually got the string? Because <laughs> we had to <laughs> kind of hang to the radio to the side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember that? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, Hot 97, and, but, you know, that was always difficult. It was sometimes fuzzy. So 94.3. So it's, it's, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. Nice. So that says a lot about you already. You you love good music. That's a great start. <laughs> right, yeah, I actually um I, I am a musician by training. So uh, okay. I I was introduced into jazz in in high school, my high school age, and I I ended up going to the Educational Center for the Arts, which is a New Haven magnet school. Um, I studied with uh, several local musicians like Warren Bird, who is a jazz pianist in Hartford. Um, I'm trying to think who else, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I, I certainly appreciate all types of music and, nice. uh, and I still perform even, even to this day, I don't play piano so much anymore, but when I do campaign events, I, I do have a band that we play some, some, you know, oldies. We typically do Beatles songs. Nice. So, so piano was the only instrument that you play or you play multiple? Right, guitar. Well, for this band, I, I do, do do guitar. That's right. Nice. I love it. Who are some of your favorite artists while we're on mm. the music topic? So it's, it's interesting. So the Arts Council did a profile of me and my family. My dad was a board member of Jazz Haven. And back in the 70s, before I was born, he brought a lot of very prominent jazz musicians to New Haven. So uh, Chick Corea, Keith Jarrett, uh, Sonny Rollins, McCoy Tyner. And this was all, um, this wasn't his, his day job. He was a teacher at ACES, but the idea was to create, um, and the name of the organization was Creative Concerts. He would bring these jazz musicians to New Haven. They would perform for free and the oh, proceeds yeah. would go to special needs um, student programs. That's awesome. So it, it sounds like you come from a family of service, providing a service. Uh, we're going to get into your platform a little bit later. Let's continue with being raised in West Haven. What was that like for you? So I, I grew up, uh, I don't know how many of the listeners are familiar with different parts of New Haven, but um, the Knox, Knox Street was the street where I was born. And and after a couple of years, my parents um we're, we're given a, a an interest-free loan by a neighbor to go to the next street over. And uh, so I grew up in the Knox Street neighborhood. It, it is mostly, I would say it's it certainly was at the time majority black, uh, mm -hmm. African-American. It's become hit, um, more Hispanic influence as well. But I think growing up in that area, like we're talking about the, the culture of hip hop and um, black culture, yeah. was something that I grew up with. And I think it gives me appreciation for, you know, the diversity that we have in New Haven. Uh, apologies, I have a cat that's having some sneezing right now. I, I know I heard a pet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think growing up in that situation has given me a, uh, certainly a, an appreciation for, um, you know, some of our neighborhoods in New Haven and 
and you know what are the the assets and and what are some of the you know challenges as well when you so growing up in an african american community did you know early on my future is going to be in politics i'm going to do something in politics to be to be a leader in this city uh, you can probably guess no <laughs> my life i think uh you know, I, I, I was really inspired by music, you know, and so I think from especially my high school years, going to Educational Center for the Arts and studying music, and I thought that I was going to be a professional jazz musician, and boy, I wish I could go back to myself and say how difficult that is. Yeah. Of course, there are, there are several musicians that have come out of New Haven that have been very successful. I know Christian Sands. He uh, he graduated from ECA as well. I'm trying to think. Uh, there, there's a there's a number of successful musicians that I grew up around. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, obviously, my life has taken different twists and turns since then. Absolutely. So, what were some of those twists and turns that kind of geared you in this direction? So you you mentioned kind of this idea of service, and mm -hmm. I I do think that was something that I grew up with. Like I said, my dad was very involved in the special needs population and organizing events to raise money for that. Um, he also, you know, I would grow up, we, we used to bake bread and bring it to 311 Church Street um, for the soup kitchen, which now I'm interestingly a, a board member of. So I, I think there was, I grew up with this aspect of service. And then, you know, in my 20s, it's very interesting. I, I, did, I had gotten into um, many different types of music and I was exploring classical Indian music and I decided to go to India. And I was in India and in South India for about nine years in my 20s. Wow. Um, totally different experience. And I was actually there when this tsunami of 2004 happened. Like I was in the water about a football field away from the Arabian Sea. And so I think being part of that experience and the devastation that followed and then connecting with those communities and really trying to rebuild Mm -hmm. um, that was certainly a life changing event that has informed, um, you know, what, it, what it means to have impact on a community. And I think when I came back from that experience, I, I, I came back to New Haven, I wasn't sure what to do professionally. And so I worked in hospitality. I was a, a server and bartender at a number of establishments. I probably served you a drink at Pacifico. I like to say <laughs> that to, to some people. And, you know, again, this is this is kind of the eclectic experiences I've had, right, working in, um, you know, in, in the service industry, uh, living abroad and being part of humanitarian efforts, um, you know, to where I am now, which is I, I, I saw an opportunity to learn how to code, which, you know, to be a software engineer without going to a accredited or university or program, I went from being a bartender and making maybe 25,000 to learning how to code and becoming a software engineer and making close to six figures within less than a year. Um, and so that, that was part of my journey as well as becoming um, part of the tech ecosystem and startups. And then from there, as a in working for consulting firms, I've been able to take my technology experience, expand on it with how do organizations think strategically, and in particular, how do state governments and local governments really address challenges like affordable housing, education, um, how do we grow our economy and address racial disparities? And so I've, that's been my journey. And you know, I've always been driven by having an impact. And for me, I, I can't think of something that's more meaningful than taking these experiences and this wealth of experience I've had in doing something meaningful and impactful here where I'm from. Yeah. Um, so that's that's really what this is about. You, If you just turned in, this is Tom Goldenberg. He is one of our mayoral candidates. He just gave you a couple, a couple of the platform uh, sections that we're going to cover. But I want to go to the education. You spoke about coding. That's a booming business right now. Yes. And you did not go to your traditional school for that. So how did you earn your certification in that? Right. So there are a number of non-accredited coding boot camps. Um, and so I went to one where six to seven months, you have a very intensive training 
Um, and I really, really applied myself because I saw it as an opportunity. Um, and and I, this goes back to, you know, education, K-12 education. I think when I look at my experiences in education, I studied music. And then when I was in India, I learned languages. And while it might seem that these are not related to the field that I eventually ended up in, I think the concentration and the discipline that I learned in those two things helped me be really successful in coding. And I've seen that with a lot of other former musicians as well. So I think, you know, when we think about STEM careers, I don't, I don't think they're separate from the arts. I think mm -hmm. my arts training really prepared me to excel um, as a software engineer. And I, I listen, I mean, New Haven Public School students, only 10% of students get exposed to any computer science. It's like five times lower than the state average. And, you, you know, there's a saying, you can't be what you don't see. Absolutely. And I, I think that a lot of kids in eighth grade, ninth grade, we need to inspire them and show like even without a college degree, there are so many opportunities for you to do stuff that is is both interesting, impactful, and lucrative. You know, you can make money as well. Um, and it, it, I, I, I think that's one thing that I would like to bring to our education system. The other thing I'd like to have is an elective for entrepreneurship for all high school students, because whether you go into a trade or a profession, um, the skills of entrepreneurship, of thinking like an owner, mm -hmm. are going to be helpful in any, any career path. Yeah, we don't, or at least for me, we really didn't get introduced to that until we were on a collegiate level. So I, I commend you on that. It's, it's missing from our school systems now, just the idea of money, money literacy. So that's, that's wonderful. Do you have a plan in place of how we're going to attack this? Well, I think that goes hand in hand with entrepreneurship. I think financial literacy and entrepreneurship are, are not really two separate things because when you, I, what I've, I've served as a mentor for several small businesses in New Haven. And what I've seen is how, like the basic questions of how do I create a budget? How do I forecast how much sales I need to be, uh, you know, to be able to have this be a sustainable goal are, are skills that are really in dire need. And I think teaching those skills are transferable, whether you want to look at your individual finances or you want to look at starting a business I think it's all connected you mentioned faith how has your faith growing up as a Christian shape who you are today and your platform well so what I would say about faith I grew up in a multi-faith family so mm -hmm. my my father's side of the family is Jewish uh, mm -hmm. my mom mother's side is Catholic so mm -hmm. I, I was I, I I've since um, uh, converted to Judaism, and I, I'm part of a synagogue in in New Haven. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, my I've gotten exposed to so many different faiths from growing up with a multi faith family to living in India, where it's a completely different um, you know faith background. And, and and a lot of people don't know South India is actually religiously very diverse. In Kerala, you have uh, a strong Hindu um, faith. Uh, Muslim, as well as Christian. Mm -hmm. And so all these experiences for me has, has just confirmed that, you know, the, the importance of all our faith traditions. And I, I truly believe that we're, that, that they all serve to create a, a sense of community, of service, of respect for one another. And, and uh, that's, that's part of what I believe. It's not just about tolerance. It's about acceptance, if that Absolutely. makes sense. Oh, it absolutely does. Nine years in India. Just to stray for a second, tell us about the culture shock. Tell us about the cultural differences in living in India for nine years and then coming back. I didn't have a hot shower for nine years. <laughs> we, used oh, my wake, goodness. we used to wake up and we'd have uh, like a just a cold faucet, uh, like a, a pot, and you just dump that over your head. And so I'm so glad... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, and we, I'll be honest, you know, staying in some of the conditions, a lot of times we didn't have a bed, we'd have a straw mat. And so mm -hmm. you know, seeing just different conditions um, and living just gives me a certain, you know, it, it, 
what's happiness, right? So that's the big question, right? Some of in some of these villages where people are living very simply uh, are some of the happiest people I've met. Mm -hmm. And so I think that gave me an appreciation that, you know, it's it's really about the the non tangible things, the the community, the family, um, a personal sense of 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 meaning that that um, and, and that's something that I do think I brought back with me. Uh, he's on the Democratic ballot, by the way. We're going to speak about family. Tell us a little bit about your immediate family. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, both my parents are retired local public school teachers. Um, I have a five-year-old who's a, a kindergartner right now. And, uh, you know, this is a, a phase of my life. I'm really happy to be in New Haven. It was such, you know, I, I, I have not been continuously in New Haven through the entire stretch of my life. I have, like I said, I've gone to India there's a stretch of my life where for my wife's career, we went to New York and I was in New York City for a while. Um, and I'm so happy to be raising my family. And, uh, it, it, you know, it was it was not easy to work. It, it, we were in New York at the time and I was I had just finished my my startup. I was working for a consulting company. And my wife was a um, tenure track professor at Hofstra on Long Island. And one day we were at a restaurant and my wife just says to me, what if we move back to New Haven? And I was so happy. I was so happy that she said that. And it was not easy because my work was centered in New York. Hers was in Long Island. But we said, let's just do it. We're going to make it work. And for her, that meant like three and a half hour drives to Long Island to go to work. For me, it meant driving to, you know, or going to New York or sometimes driving to Boston. Um, but it ultimately worked out. My wife is now the chair elect of the public health program department at University of New Haven. And uh, and hopefully I have a job in New Haven soon, too. You did speak already about the small wonders of the world. When you lived in India, you couldn't take a hot shower, but they were in happier times there when they didn't have a lot. So affordable housing here. Tell me about why that's a part of your platform. Um, I, I think as a country, we're in a, a housing affordable housing right. crisis. Yes. Um, it, it, it's interesting. I I spent a number of days on the city buses last week just talking to people, and one of the things that kept coming up was housing. Um, either that the rent is increasing at a rate that people can't can't uh, afford. Or, or that they're not able to even get housing. A lot of people that should qualify for housing assistance just don't get it. Mm. And, and this is, I think, the, one of the great tragedies right now that we see, which is, you know, if you look at our, our social safety net, right, we're very good about food. If, if you qualify for food assistance, the SNAP program, you get it, generally speaking. I mean... It's, it's not perfect. But if you qualify for housing assistance, you don't necessarily get it. In fact, some many of the people I spoke to are say that there are thousands, thousands of people behind on the wait, lo the wait list to get mm -hmm. housing. And so I, I think as a country, it's something that we need to grapple with, that we don't do a good job with housing assistance. Um, I, I would I would propose that the state uh, and certainly that as a country, we make uh, the voucher program and entitlement, which means that if you do qualify for housing assistance, you should get it. And yeah. it's it's really heartbreaking talking to people who uh, you know have jobs, who are trying to live stable lives, but just can't get access to housing. So that's that's first and foremost at a at a, a top level what I think needs to happen. But as a city, there's there is a lot of things that we can do. We certainly need to encourage more supply of housing. Um, we need to, you know, continue to try to collaborate with, um, you know, mixed use and having more affordable units. I think um, another thing that I would call for is that some reasonable way to stabilize rents, especially in areas where, um, like, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like, I think New Hallville and Fairhaven, we've seen rents go up a lot. Absolutely. We've proper property taxes go up more than 40%, if you can imagine that, um, which is, you know, partially due to this 
prop this property revaluation that was done a year ago, um, I'm seeing in all the majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods, property taxes are up 40%. Yes. And that is just going to push people out of their homes. It's going to push rent up. So number one, I'm saying that we need to freeze property taxes. Um, and that's something I would be committed to. I think we need to create ways to stabilize rents in areas where rents are increasing far beyond the rate of inflation and changes in property taxes. And I think we need to encourage more um, owner occupied investment. Because we do have a lot of buyers that come in from out of state. They rent out, they increase the rent and they don't usually take care of the property. You were speaking about you ne we need more owner occupied units because I do find that when they're owner occupied and rented out, there's a little bit more care for the property. And we also see two parter. We also see these big companies that buy up all of the property, raise the rent and really don't take care of the property. What's your take on that, Mr. Goldenberg? Yeah, so quickly, I would say I, I, I do think there needs to be an incentive for people who are buying for 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 actually living in the place that mm -hmm. we've seen across the country, 25 percent of single family purchases are for people that are not using it for to, to live in. Right. For mm -hmm. investment. And when you're competing of uh, shelter and investment, I mean, investment is going to win. So I think we need to level that out a little bit more and, and encourage and give incentives for people who are going to live in the house, whether it be single family or, um, you know, a small multifamily, et cetera. I mean, the other thing, what you mentioned, I think I've heard from a lot of residents that the building code enforcement ability of the city is, is not doing a good job. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we, as mayor, I would want to revisit that and, and see what we're doing. Uh, I mean, it's got to be fair to both renters and property owners. But the fact is that uh, what I'm hearing, I'm hearing, you know, pretty bad stories about an inability of the city to enforce building code. Yeah. So I, I think that that needs to be looked at and we need to really revitalize that agency. And, and you mentioned that we need to provide more housing. We have a uh, it's scarce right now with housing, which is why it's wonderful. We have another gentleman here with us. He is a developer. His name is Mr. Rodney Williams. Mr. Williams, thank you for joining us. Appreciate that. Um, I want to piggyback on what you guys talking about with the, um, the, the landlords buying the, um, the properties. I'm familiar with, with, with a lot of them. Um, I'm actually um, familiar when they first started coming and buying. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the problems is that you got a lot of developers coming from out of the city, got a lot of money. And if the deal pencils where um, they see profit, um, they buy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about the profit. It's never about the tenant. Right. So when the property start falling apart, it's always about the profit. Mm -hmm. So you have people here buying property for other people managing their money, giving them investments back, but not reinvesting in the property when the property start falling apart because the, the agreement that they have with the, with the investors are, give us a certain amount of million dollars. We're going to give you a certain amount of money on your return. And that's all they're concerned about. So when the property start falling apart, you know what I mean? Who taking the loss? The right. guy that's maintaining the property, he's not taking a loss. The investor that's investing the money, he don't want to hear nothing because he like, well, you told me I'm going to make a certain amount of money. I think that the city of New Haven, um, because everybody coming here is a gold mine, um, I don't know who um, it should be on the mayor, the board of alders. Um, they should do something um, that makes these people um, accountable. Mm -hmm. And LCI, let's just be clear about one thing. You know, you know, they might be mad at me because I'm going to say this. Um, they're not doing a job. You know what I mean? They, they like a dog with no teeth. Let's you know? give you let's give you a, a formal introduction, Mr. Williams, because you kind of came through real strong <laughs> joining the conversation. Yeah. So. <laughs> Listen, if you don't know who I am, now, you know. You know so, so Mr. Williams is uh, he one. He's here with us because he is going to be speaking to a, a, one of the concerns and one of the major issues that Mr. Goldenberg wants to address here in the city of New Haven. So we're going to get to that in a second. But give us before you come through barking. Give us a little background about you. 
My name is Rodney Williams. I grew up in New Hallville. I went to Hill House. I used to be the co-chair of the 21st Ward. Um, I was the vice chair of uh, Dixwell uh, Management Team. I also was the vice chair of school construction. I was a commissioner of economic competitiveness for the state of Connecticut. I was on a community task force for police and relationships in New Haven. Um, so, um, He's I'm, here. He's here and he's yeah, strong. And, I, and how do you yeah, guys know each other? How have you met? What's your relationship? Um, I met Tom. I follow um, I follow what's going on for, for the mayor's campaign. And, um, you know, he, he's he's been um, a couple of issues that he's speaking about. Um, I'm a community person. So, you know, when you speak about something that I feel impact the community, if I can help you um, address that, that's what I do. And you also did uh, some construction for the Q House, yes? Yeah, yeah, we did the Q House. Um, I'm actually um, we we on the Munster Street project right now. We're gonna be doing um the drywall over there. Um, yeah, I did the Q House. I did a lot of projects. Um, Beulah Land, we did projects for them. Um, when they did the first phase of Ashman Street, um, I did that. So I've, I've been um I've been in the city for a long time. We got a landscaping company. We take care of the Dixwell Plaza or Concord. We do the snow removal mm -hmm. and um take that over there. So yeah, I'm I'm um we give away food. Um, I gave a hundred thousand masks away in the city of New Haven. Um, so I did, you know, so everybody in New Haven, you know, Juan, Juan did, Juan did a whole bunch of um, mask giveaways with me. He's you know speaking I mean? about Juan Castillo, by the way. So it yeah. sounds like you're saying, if you need me, I'm around, basically. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm around. I'm around. You know what I mean? Um, I just feel like um, in our city, um, I don't know what it is, but we need more people to st st step up. You know what I mean? And, well, that's uh, that's exactly what Mr. Goldenberg is planning to do. And and by the way, the election is coming up in September. September twelfth. September twelfth. Yeah. Let Let's go ahead and dig into. We already spoke about the education. We spoke about affordable housing, supporting small businesses. Tell us very briefly about your take on that. What's your platform on that? So uh, yes, I I think we need to do more. In short. I think, um, I, you know, I'm certainly open to a discussion with the community of, of business owners and, and how to support more uh, minority business ownership and particularly black business ownership. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that there needs to be a better effort to work with the business communities in areas like Dixwell, um, Whaley and Grand Avenue and, and, and have a coordinated approach to developing these areas and support for the business leaders. I, I took a tour of some businesses on Grand Avenue and and um, a lot of them are struggling. You know, there's uh, either crime or quality of life issues nearby. And I think that when we look at economic development for the city, um, I, my, one of the things I've, I, I've called for is that these commercial corridors should have a specific person assigned to them to work with that business community and help them to address their needs. Um, so it's a continuing conversation. It's also, you know, um, we've had conversations with Rodney about some of our minority contracting guidelines. I, I think there's been a general sense that local black businesses have not benefited as much from the, the programs. Uh, and I think that that should change. Um, but like I said, I'm, I'm open to further in the conversation and sitting down with more business leaders and I, I did talk to you about the need to include entrepreneurship and in, in these skills as well in our education system as well. Absolutely. And um, and speaking, and I'm sorry, Mr. Williams, were you going to say something? Yes, because um, what you're talking about right now, that's exactly uh, what I'm involved heavily in. So when you talk about, um, when you look at the city of New Haven and you look at economic development, um, came to our city probably about 10 years ago, um, and they have a plan, they have a blueprint. And you see the blueprint being put together. But what you don't see is a blueprint where it was economically impacting the black community. It was, there's no plan. Mm -hmm. You look at everything that's being constructed around our city from the housing where we can't afford to the jobs that we're not getting, um, even the houses that, that, that they're, they're building. Um, it's kind of hard for us to even get the work. And the truth is, where is the workforce that needed to be developed with the residents to build what was coming to our city? Because mm -hmm. we knew it was coming. And like when I was talking to Tom, me and him talk heavily. And, and when he, like his plan, what I say to him is this, 
if your plan don't have us at the table to talk about what we need, how can you help us? And right. that's what's going on now. That mm-hmm. They keep saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And I always say my favorite line is this. If you're going to feed me, ask me what I'm not allergic to. Mm-hmm. And when you I, say they, let's be specific. Who was Who's the I, they you're I'm referring talking, to? I'm talking about the, 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 the administration in the city of New Haven. I'm talking about... um small business, Lil Snyder program, you know, the programs that they got set up there for the county. Okay. So they don't necessarily impact the city. So when, even when Paul Bass did his, his report, it showed who was making the money and, and it wasn't the city. So I just feel like, why does the city pay for a program that don't benefit the residents? Why are we putting that bill? Why are we growing the county? And let's be clear about one thing. Um, my company is, my company's on New Haven. I've been in New Haven all my life. Yes. I live in North Haven right now. And, and the truth is, we do very little business with the city of New Haven. So me, I fight for um, those that need need to come up. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of work here, a lot of money here. And the truth is, we're not getting we're getting we're getting very little. You know what I mean? Yeah. Very little. Well, so so let me ask you, and I know this is something that you both wanted to speak to: economic development, what is beneficial to the black community being a part of the conversation, a part of the plan to action. There are some businesses that you feel have entered into the community that should not be there. That's negatively impacting the community. Is that correct? So well, let's, let's, let's talk about this, right? Okay. So, so one of the things that came to my attention in this campaign was there was a lot of, um, you know, mistrust in, in some of our communities with some of the efforts of methadone clinics. And I didn't want to jump to any conclusion. Um, and, and, you know, my, my wife, her, she's involved in public health. So I, 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 I absolutely respect the mission of public health and saving lives. So what I, what I did initially was I spent a week um, just hanging out at these locations. And I actually published a diary. It's like 3,200 words. I talk about um, interviews I did with both patients, clinic staff, and even some of the illegal drug dealers in front of some of these locations, like the one on Congress Avenue. And, you know, me and Ronnie, we've talked about this. The, the biggest thing I'll say is this. I think it makes no sense for a methadone clinic to be 300 feet from a school. Mm-hmm. And the school was there first. A lot of people don't, a lot of people assume that that, that App Foundation was there for X many years, and then the school was built. We looked up the deed, and that's not true. John Daniel School was built in 2006. App Foundation came in in 2014, mm-hmm. right, right, riding in at midnight when nobody knew about it. And I, I think there are certainly, I support harm reduction, I support um, public health response, but I also think that we need to reconcile with the fact that our communities have not been treated with respect. And uh, that goes for the Hill, for what happened in Newhallville when you had a completely non-transparent um, move to expand into that neighborhood by App Foundation, which they still own the building. Mm-hmm. Um, the, even, the mayor didn't even inform the local alder, which is just insane. And so I'm calling for transparency. Like if, if a methadone clinic wants to open in a residential neighborhood, there should be a public hearing about it. There should be an opportunity for residents to weigh in. I think the, the methadone clinic that is right next to John Daniel School, it should be relocated immediately, not in five years. And I think the other thing that's come up is, you know, um, in other cities, they've started exploring with what's called safe use injection sites. These are areas that there's an agreement. There's not going to be any... Um, penalty from the police or anything for uh, using heroin. And I, I, I've heard from multiple sources that the city is, you know, talking to people to try to establish something like this. Hmm. And what I've called for is transparency. I think we've seen communities be disrespected and just, you know, told to deal with something after the fact. If we were going to go in that direction, I, I would like this to be public, public conversation um, and I think we need to be smart about the zoning and the location of some of these services, because I will be honest with you, some of them work really well. I, I visited one in West Haven that was in an industrial zone. It, there was no issues. There was no drug dealing or violence or anything like that. 
but the ones that are in residential areas, particularly areas that are already struggling, and I mean, right next to a school, we shouldn't even have to discuss that, but this, right. is, this is what's, what's happening. It needs well, to change. The App Foundation, know this has been going on for years, because I used to uh, be the manager for Renaissance Management. So I see the people come in, get cab rise from out of town, yeah. get, get their methadone. Um, and then they put it right in the area where we already got drug activity for years. It's been drug activity in Hill for, for years. So what they do, they put it right there, they selling the meth, getting dope, shooting up dope right right in the community, right by where the kids are. So, so what's what's your first call to action, Mr. Goldenberg? If you are elected, is this the top of the list of what you are going to address? I think this is one of the things. And I, I think there's some pretty straightforward things we can do. I mean, I, I'm actually speaking about this at a state level. I, I Today I spoke in a public health committee at the state legislature via Zoom. Um, I, I called for some just common sense you know, things to implement. I think that methadone clinics and safe use site injections should not be within a certain proximity to a school. And that's something that should uh, we should adopt at a state level. I also called, as I said, public hearings, these, you know, a public notice. I mean, when you, when it, uh, a restaurant gets a liquor license, there's a public notice that they're going to get. There's an opportunity to comment, an opportunity for a community to say, no, we don't want that. Yeah. Why didn't we have that in New Hallville? I mean, it's just common sense stuff. So there's a lot of stuff I want to do. This is certainly not the, the uh, on education. There's a lot I want to bring on housing um, and um, small business support and public safety. But I mean, this is something that is just right staring at us right in our face. And nobody has been doing anything about it for years. And Let me ask you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Williams. That's that's the one thing that I talked to him about. Like I, I don't understand that. Like he come along, he see this issue that's been in our community forever. He see it, he got a conscience, he said this is wrong, he write, they publish it, he gets attention. Why does it take somebody white to talk about what's going on in the black community mm -hmm. to get to get attention? When we like how how are you blind and deaf? How you didn't hear me telling you this or hear the cries of our community right. but when the white guy running for mayor talk about it, it it's front and center i know you're you're not running for mayor mr williams but i do want to hear from both of you on this question before i ask you about your platform and what you plan to do about the crime on this question the the term is only two years and you hope to get reelected so that you can continue the work that you started for the first two years. How do you see yourself, if you are elected, being successful in just a short two-year period? Is, speak to us about that. Well, I, I'm used to short timelines. So <laughs> some of the projects I've been involved in, sometimes you get four weeks and it's just intense. So I, I, I mean, I, I would be supportive of four-year terms. I think that's very similar to a lot of you know major cities across the U.S. Um, but even within two years, I can lay the groundwork. I can um, I can certainly I think that we can certainly make a difference in our education system. I mean, it takes work to be last of the state. I mean, let's 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 talk about that. The fact that we were last in the state behind Waterbury, Bridgeport, 168 towns and cities, uh, and so. It, we're not going to go from last to first, but I think definitely applying some rigor, applying some accountability and um, transparency into that will will help to make some impact that people will see. Um, I think that, you know, my my approach to building the city and uh, helping to create job opportunities and some of these things require a little bit more of a time horizon, but I can start to lay some of the groundwork. Yeah. And Mr. Williams, you want to respond to the question? I'm definitely going to respond to that. Listen, it's like through my lenses, you see my, you'll hear my truth and see my truth, and through his, you, it's the same thing. Everybody's lenses is, is that. So you're right about what you're saying about the four years, um, given the opportunity. But here's the bad part. So if we elect somebody that's not capable of helping especially in the black and Hispanic community, um, they're gonna drag us for four years. 
Mm. Um, and if candidates really do their homework and really know what's going on in this city, let's be clear about one thing. Um, you should be able to get some work done in two years. And I feel like if you put the right team together mm. and you know yeah. what's going on mm -hmm. and, and, and the issues that need to be addressed, you can get it done in two years. So I hear what you're saying about the four. You're right about that. But I think in New Haven, um, don't let our past be our future. Mm -hmm. In the past, we have not, our community is not growing with this with the with the growth of the city. Yeah. This city does not need nobody for four years until we at least start leveling the playing field. And then we look at that four years. Yeah. Because in four years, look what happened with Trump. In four years, look what could happen to look what happened to America. What you think hey, happened? Hey, it sounds like the cat agrees with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's some noise. Yeah. That's out of the bag. All right, let's move to our, our last topic, which we've kind of briefly brushed upon crime. Any yeah. thoughts and ideas on how we are going to address this ridiculous rate of crime? Homicide yeah, is yeah. just out of hand. It's ridiculous. So, so two things come to mind. Um, one is we, we actually used to have some programs that were quite effective. I think the, the USTAP program that was under Mayor Harp was a, a good program of providing early intervention for people that are at risk and intervening with their families and finding opportunities. So I want to bring that back and build upon it. And the other thing is, um, you know, from a public health approach, I think there's the, one of the policy ideas I, I would like to explore is the idea of creating a hotline for individuals to um, say that so-and-so, maybe family member or friend might be at risk of, of getting involved in violence. Um, we can use that to remove any illegal guns, but there will be no prosecution. And this is something that we're exploring with the Johns Hopkins University Center for Gun Violence Prevention. Um, they would certainly be um, able to help us to implement that. But there needs to be a discussion and, 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 and this can't, this has to come bottom up, right? I mean, this has to be, uh, to Rodney, your point, I mean, people have to be at the table and people have to be part of this discussion. But I think the, the prevalence of the, the illegal guns is, is troubling and that has to be part of, part of the strategy. Yeah, the ghost guns, they're, they're out of hand. I know you have something to say, Mr. Williams. Yes, you're sitting there saying, I know he bought the letter loose. That's his perspective, and that's through his lenses. Um, but the problem in, in our country is that um, most people at the table um, don't look like us, but want to come up with a solution to help us. And that's why we are where we are now. Now, when I look at crime, um, and I was on the police force, or I was on the um, task force for police and career relations, here's what I'm going to say. Um, you look at the kids stealing the cars, you look at the ghost guns, you look at all this stuff. Um, one thing that we need to do. Um, raise the bonds. Okay, let's stop playing. Okay, we catch you stealing the cars, we catch you with the guns, let's raise the bond. First thing that's going to do is um, keep your butt in jail. People get bonded out, you get caught up in the court system, they they out, go get another gun, shoot somebody, and and um, that's crazy. Like, everybody worrying about, oh, we don't want to give um, kids or black kids no record because of what happened in the past. Yeah. Now, what happened in the past, you're right. They was out here arresting us and, and um, you know, throwing illegal stuff on us, giving us records and all that. And, and I respect what's going on. But what happened was they feel guilty now of, of their past things that they did. So now they're like, well, don't arrest them. Don't do this. Don't do that. But meanwhile, our community is off the hook. We're suffering, yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that, that help ain't help sometimes. So listen, the first Maybe 50, 60 parents might be upset. Oh, you know, my son, he got to go to jail for this. You know, the truth is this. Yes. Okay? You got to go to jail. This needs to stop. You got to stealing cars, shooting people, all kind of stuff. And DCF, you can't even discipline your kid no more. You try to discipline them, they want to lock you up. Yeah. We're, we're talking about people that are going to be at the table. Uh, Mr. Goldenberg, is it safe to say that if you are elected... This gentleman will be at your table. The whole city of New Haven is at my table. Okay. 
Okay. And, and, and I, I am not afraid to steal anyone's idea. <laughs> Whoever, whoever's elected, I will be at, I, I have no problem with speaking with anybody and everybody that's running because the truth is this. What I'm talking about is issues that's concerning the city. Yeah. The residents, the community. And I'm community. Before we go, Mr. Goldenberg, what are your final key points that you want to leave us with for people that are just hearing you, listening to you, becoming familiar with you for the first time? What are the takeaways that you want them to know? Well, I, I want them to know that uh, I'm someone who grew up around here. I'm, I'm someone that's passionate about the city. I'm someone who who will not settle for, for what's happening right now in our education system being last in the state. And I think that this administration has lost touch with our communities. Um, and, and so we need someone with vision. We need someone who is pragmatic and get, can get things done and someone who has experience. And I, you know, I put myself forward. I think I can be that person. And I, I hope to have the honor of the support of the city. And do you have a website up as of yet? Yes, where people can yes, follow? Sorry. So uh, you can learn more about, you know, about me, about my policies, Tom for newhaven.com. That's T O M F O R newhaven.com. And, uh, and I'm, I'm available for, if you want to reach out, it's got my contact info on the website as well. Nice. And Mr. Williams for you, for people to reach out to you and any last takeaways from you. Listen, I need a 40 piece by myself. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> listen, I got a whole, listen, you'd be surprised. We can, talk, we can talk about a whole bunch of stuff. That's who I am. No, I, no. I can tell. I can tell. Yeah, but I, that for today and this yeah. segment, that yeah. is our time. We have to wrap up for today with the electric drum. I thank you both for joining us. Uh, Mr. Goldenberg, it was a pleasure meeting you. I know we will speak again probably for a part two as mm -hmm. we journey to election day. You have found out so much about him. If you want to learn more, he gave you his website. Please go check him out and reach out to him. Uh, very approachable. That's one thing I can say about him. Down to earth and he loves good music. We listen to a little bit of hip hop as we celebrate 50 years. So make sure you reach out to him and make sure you keep it locked right here to YBC. You have more great music coming in after the break. And join me back here next Sunday for another episode of The Electric Drum. I'm Wanda Coppage. Enjoy your evening.